so good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time today, and I know we have so many newbies today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I know for many of you, it's your first few weeks back in class with students, so welcome back to the classroom. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. We really, really appreciate it. So we do free live interactive broadcasts every month connecting the world's top scientists and explorers to classrooms. We hope you'll continue to join us and check out exploringbytheseat.com to learn more about the amazing programs coming up to wrap up the month. Now today I am so excited because this is our second of 20 programs as part of the epic Science Literacy Week, Week of Wonder. So Science Literacy Week is Canada's largest science festival held coast to coast by the NSERT team and the federal government and so many other amazing organizations. And to celebrate the week, the Canadian Association of Science Theaters banded together. They got all together with us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. They said, why not showcase all of Canada's most amazing, these places where kids and families and people go to learn about the cosmos, learn about the world around them, and to engage with science in a really fun and exciting way. And so we are doing just that. We've got 20 programs all week long, every single day at 10, 12, 1, and 2 Eastern. This is our second, and I'm so excited to dive in. Now, earlier today, we got to do What's Your Inquiry with the Ontario Science Centre, and now we are flying eh, several hours west out to Calgary to tell a spark, uh, the Spark Science Centre. They do amazing stuff there, and we are going to turn it over to Elaine in just a minute, who's going to tell us a little bit about the programs that Telespark has on the go, some of their award-winning virtual programs. We're going to introduce a special guest that you guys might know from the sheer amount of you that registered, and dive in. So I'm so excited to get underway. Thank you so much for joining us today, Elaine, and take us away. Hello everybody, my name is Elaine and my pronouns are she, her. I work at Telespark here in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. If you haven't visited, you should definitely come by here. And we are proud members of the Canadian Association of Science Centers. And I'm so excited to be here today to be talking to you about our Direct From programs. Um, and today we're doing Direct From Polar Bears International. So before we begin, um, we always really like to share and acknowledge the fact that we are um, situated on a traditional top, which includes the Gainai, Pigani, Sixagane First Nations, and the Blackfeet of Montana, who have made this land home for thousands of years. In 1877, Treaty 7 was signed by the members of Nanitsatapi, the Sutina First Nation, the Ayahe Nakoda, inclusive of the Wesley, Chiniki, and Bearspaw First Nation, alongside the Government of Canada. The city of Calgary is home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, all all newcomers and settlers. We are all treaty people. This science center sits within a natural travel, migration, and hunting corridor. It leads people and animals to the confluence of the Bow and Elbow Rivers, a traditional and current trading and gathering area for the Nitsitabi and all people that call Calgary home. We are grateful to the Treaty Seven Nations who have been caretakers and stewards of this land, allowing us to thrive on this land today where many cultures live together in peace and respect. So I am, for personally, I am completely grateful to be able to teach you today on this land and have this opportunity to teach you and talk to you today about what is happening with TELUS Park. So we are, like I said earlier, I'm here to bring you a TELUS Park program that is part of our Direct From series. Um, and our Direct From programs connect students with scientific experts in the field and can virtually bring areas that are normally behind closed doors into your classrooms. So if you ever wanted to watch a live knee surgery while talking to a surgeon or ask an expert about Banff National Park, check out our Direct From programs at sparkscience.ca. And uh, Jesse had put that uh, up, <laughs> website up there. Um, and today we've partnered with Polar Bears International to talk about the mighty polar bear and its Arctic habitat. And to do that, we've partnered with Alisa from Polar Bears International, who's an amazing person, and I'm going to let her introduce herself and let her take it away. Great, thank you so much, Elaine, and thanks, Jesse. I'm gonna just screen share here because I have some really cool pictures I'd love to show everybody. Screen share. Okay, hang on, okay. Jesse. Is this working? It's working now. You're almost there. I'll wait till the slides are up. But this is half the fun of video broadcast. It has to take a look. I know. Does yeah. that, can you see that at all? We've got right now, you're in, we've got like an epic into the distance. It's like us, like 8,000 times. When you have your PowerPoint up, it'll appear. I'll show, I'll bring it up the moment it's up. <laughs> <laughs> the Jeopardy thing is fun. 
I know it's going to be worth it. I promise because you guys would much rather. Cool. Um, can you, does this look right? No, it's still a black screen. The nose is that close, but you don't want to pull her hair to be that close to you. So right now we've got your slide deck up, but we can't go full screen with it. So let's play around with it and see while okay. you're doing I'll bring up Polar Bears International's website on the bottom of our screen, which is truly an amazing organization. Yeah. I had the chance to actually go to Churchill this year and see some of the work that Polar Bears International does in person. Uh, one of the polar, you know, the polar bear capital of the world, a really, really special place. So I really encourage you guys to check out that website, see the amazing work they do to save the greatest carnivore there is on land. Elise, I'm sorry, it's I giving you trouble. This is no fun. No worries. I think I can figure it out here. Let's. It looks a little better now. Oh, it did look a little better. It did. On the bottom of your screen, there's a little symbol that looks like a projector screen right beside the toggle bar with a minus and plus. So the final yeah. line, push to the left of that, and if you press that, it should go full, but it yeah. doesn't. It makes it black for us. That's not good. Worst wow. case, if it doesn't want to work, you can show us these mini pictures, and then you can show us things that I know you have in person there. We might have to do that, yeah. Let's, yeah, sorry, everybody. That's okay. Let's try this one more time. Like feeling this. While you're pulling it up, I'll just say a huge welcome to our classes joining in on YouTube. We had 179 classes registered for today. We got folks in Thunder Bay, Calgary, Louisiana, so all over North America joining us. It was really, really exciting. So, welcome in, guys. All right. Is this working at all? It is not. You're still the black screen. Well, I just don't have a clue. All right. Well, I can just talk then. We'll just chat about it. Let's talk about polar bears together. Let's maybe. talk about it. All right. Cool. Yeah. And you know what I can do? I can share a lot of these slides with you, Jesse, to promote for everyone um, later. Yeah. I just don't know why. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Well, let's just, uh, yeah, uh, let's yeah. just talk about polar bears. Okay. Well, we're going to just go. So thank you, everyone, for joining. <laughs> Sorry about that. My name is Elisa, pronouns she, her, and I'm coming to you live from Whitehorse, Yukon in Canada. So kind of next door neighbors to Alaska. Uh, I am on the territory of the Kwanlun Dun First Nation and Tan Kwachan Council, and just so grateful to be living in Whitehorse in this beautiful area. But of course, when it comes to polar bears, I have to travel to the Arctic to go see polar bears. Now I've been working with polar bears for just over 10 years now. And I work for an organization called Polar Bears International. And at Polar Bears International, our mission is to keep polar bears in the Arctic, to make sure they have their Arctic sea ice habitat and do what we can to keep them in the North long term. And we do this with a mixture of research, education, media, and advocacy. And so basically it means we want to learn more about polar bears, we want to talk to more people about polar bears, and we want to get everyone on the same page that, hey, these are an animal that we want to keep in the North, but things that we do for them are good for all of us. So it really is such an amazing species to be studying because they really are an umbrella species. So everything we do for them is good for everything under their umbrella, including humans. So polar bears are an extra special bear. There are eight species of bears around the world and polar bears are the biggest of all of them. They are the absolute biggest bear you can find. And they are the only marine bear. So their lifestyle is completely tied to the ocean. Polar bears cannot live without Arctic sea ice, which is frozen ocean. And they're the only bear that really relies on water and ocean to this extent. So very interesting, very different from a lot of the terrestrial bears. Polar bears are also the most carnivorous bear out of all of them. They eat the least amount of fruit and vegetables. In fact, their gut, their dietary system, isn't even well suited to eat fruits and vegetables nearly to the same extent as other bears. They really rely on mostly fat. So sometimes we even call them a lipovore, which means eating fat, which is, again, pretty crazy. But their number one source of food and calories is seal blubber which is one of the most calorically energy dense foods on the entire planet. And polar bears have evolved to eat seal blubber and to find seals by using this Arctic sea ice as a platform to hunt them. So polar bears are very good swimmers, 
but they cannot outswim a seal. So what they have to do is roam the frozen Arctic sea ice all across the Arctic, and they're looking for seals the whole time. They're using their nose, they're looking for, there's these ice ridges out on the sea ice, the ice kind of like shoves up, and seals will make their dens or hang out in those ridges. So polar bears will follow ridges and they'll look for seal holes because of course seals are also a mammal and seals need to breathe air. So the seal eventually has to come up through a breathing hole. So a polar bear will crouch by a seal breathing hole and wait for 24 hours or more. They're so, so, so patient, but it's worth it because they really need that seal blubber. And if you can imagine what it might feel like out on the Arctic sea ice, it's really, it can be really dark because it's the winter in the north, freezing cold, winds blowing. There's not a lot of easy food. So polar bears have to be very, very smart, very, very patient to find their food. But when they do, they're really happy and they can eat a lot in one sitting. Now their main prey of seals are called ringed seals. So those are kind of a medium, small seal and then bearded seals, which are like the big, big seals that can be a couple hundred pounds or more. And mostly the adult male polar bears will get the bearded seals because they're so big, uh, but the females will also figure out what they can do. Mostly will go for the range seals. Now the best time of year to be a polar bear for sure is in the spring. So this is when the seals are pupping. They're having their babies in the spring. And after the pups are six weeks or a couple months old, they're really nice and fat, juicy, but not very smart yet. And so this is a time of year where polar bears will just go and eat as much as they can. And we call this hyperphagia, which basically means a lot of eating. And polar bears can gain hundreds of pounds of body weight in just a month or two. It is nuts. Most of their eating happens in this tiny window of time in the year, which I think is pretty interesting. But then of course, there's times of the year where they don't eat as much. So one area that I study is Hudson Bay in Canada. And specifically, I look a lot at the Western Hudson Bay polar bear population. So there are 19 different populations around the world, broken up between um, Alaska, Canada, Russia, Norway, and Greenland. And all these different 19 polar bear populations are managed a little bit differently depending on who's doing what. Um, but the important thing is that everyone is working together. So all these five countries talk to each other, share information. We see what's going on big picture with all these polar bears because we know in certain areas, polar bears are being affected differently than in others because of the differences in their habitat and how things are changing. So in Western Hudson Bay, for example, uh, this is near Churchill, Manitoba, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. In Churchill, Manitoba, um, these are kind of the famous polar bears. And Churchill is sometimes known as the polar bear capital of the world because these bears come onto land all summer long. When Hudson Bay completely melts, the bears have to come onto land and they're gonna hang out. So they did their spring eating, so they're hopefully nice and fat. Sea ice melts, they come onto land and they wait. And they don't wanna waste any energy because they can't hunt seals on land. The seals are out in the water. They are gonna eat some berries and eggs and all that good stuff, uh, but really they're mostly fasting and living off their own body fat. And they're losing about a kilogram of fat a day from their own bodies. So they're losing weight and they're hanging out, but that means it's an amazing opportunity to see them and watch them and view them because they're mostly relaxed. We kind of know where they're gonna be. Uh, so this is a good time for researchers to go study the polar bears. And then in the fall, it's a good time for us as educators to go out and see the polar bears. So next month I'm going to Churchill and we are gonna be live streaming the polar bears as they're waiting for the sea ice to come back, which should happen in November or December. Hudson Bay will freeze up again and the polar bears are gone almost overnight. As soon as the ice is back, they are hungry and they're out. And it, it really proves to us, this is an ice bear. Yes, we might see them on land, but this is an ice bear and they really need to go eat those seals. So polar bears do have a few adaptations, of course, to live in the Arctic. It's a freezing cold, harsh environment, as you know, and as I've mentioned, so they need to have a certain type of body to weather these conditions. So one thing, of course, is their fur. So here's a piece of their fur here. Polar bears have, you can imagine, extremely, extremely thick, thick, thick fur. So they actually have two layers of it. The layer that's closest to their body is like a really woolly sweater. It's really fuzzy and warm and it's gonna keep them cozy no matter what. And this longer layer over top here, that's almost like a really nice rain jacket. 
So these furs are gonna whisk away the wet and the water, uh, the ice that they're rolling in and gonna keep the bear really, really warm. And this fur is also pretty hollow, which helps trap warm air against their body. Uh, and it's actually transparent, it's clear. So it looks white to our eyes, but that's just the trick of the light. Uh, they actually have clear hair when you look at it under a microscope. And so we sometimes say, you know, polar bears really do pick up the light around them because of their fur. So when you see a sunset or a sunrise and a polar bear in the distance, they look pink or orange or yellow. It's really beautiful. Or when they've been on land for a few months rolling around in the dirt, they can look pretty darn brown, which is kind of funny. But uh, fur is a huge one. Now, of course, when they are swimming, which again, wonderful swimmers, but swim, swimming is very energetically difficult on their body. So it burns a lot of calories and they don't swim a lot if they don't have to. But when they're swimming, their fur gets wet. And when something's wet, it's generally not very good at insulating. So that's when their body fat comes into play. So when they're swimming, it's really the body fat they have on their own bodies that's keeping them warm in the freezing cold water. And that's why it's a bit dangerous sometimes for cubs to swim because they don't have enough body fat yet. So moms with cubs really have to be smart and make some decisions about when they're going to swim or not swim. And are they going to have the cub on their back or is the cub going to swim and only swimming short distances to keep those cubs safe. Now, another adaptation that they have is very, very, very sharp claws. So you can see this claw is extremely thick. It's extremely sharp. It is perfect for gripping sea ice, slippery sea ice as you're walking and perfect for hauling seals up out of the water after you've caught a seal. So grizzly bears have longer and more dull claws that are more suited for walking on land and for rolling over logs and digging for things in the dirt. Polar bears, very much an Arctic sea ice claw. And of course, we can't forget their teeth. So I do have a skull here. This is a replica skull. This is a polar bear skull. So you can see, of course, very, very, very sharp front teeth. They do have, of course, these molars back here. They're pretty sharp for molars. For a lot of bears, you'd have kind of duller back teeth, but these ones are really good for shearing blubber and fat. And these front teeth are perfect for trying to grab a seal out of the water and pulling it up. And you can kind of see, do you see the gap um, between the front teeth and then the back teeth here? That is great to fit a seal head in there. So really well suited skull for hunting seals. And if you want to take a look right up his nose, <laughs> you can see that his nose has a lot of surface area. So this means that his nose is able to pick up a ton of scents in the air. And of course, as I mentioned, polar bears have an amazing sense of smell. They also have an organ in the back of their mouth called the Jacobson's organ, sometimes it's called. And we see something similar in cats. So if you've ever had or seen a house cat kind of make a weird face when it smells something, that face is actually trying to get more air in and smell things more deeply. And polar bears have that same sense of smell. So they can smell a seal over a kilometer away on the sea ice when the wind is right. Really important to have a really great sense of smell when you are, again, out in the dark, <laughs> in the blowing snow, trying to look for your next meal. And, and I should say on average, polar bears need to eat about a seal a week. So they're not eating every single day. Again, they're going through these phases of eating a lot, then eating almost nothing, and then kind of eating a seal a week for a long time. So they really have very interesting patterns. But that means when researchers are studying polar bears, we can look at the makeup of their fat and hair and actually analyze what they've been eating and see what kind of species they're eating and when and where, which is so, so, so cool. The science behind polar bears, I'll talk about in a minute, but we are learning so much great stuff. So I'd love to talk to you a bit about um, what's going on with polar bears. And then I do wanna say again, apologies, I can't show my slides, but I'm so excited to answer any questions you have about moms and cubs or adaptations or any research we're doing, anything like that. I do encourage any questions at the end and I'm really excited to hear what you have to say because I can talk about polar bears for hours. I'm trying to keep it to like 20 minutes here. So of course I've mentioned polar bears depend on Arctic sea ice for survival. Absolutely. Arctic sea ice, though, is not only about polar bears. It is the most amazing habitat. It looks brutal and harsh, but it is the source of so much life. So we like to say that Arctic sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to a forest. Arctic sea ice is actually growing the base of the food chain in the Arctic. 
So because the uh, sea in the Arctic is very salty, of course it's ocean. When the sea ice, it gets so cold up there, the sea ice freezes, but because there's salt in it, it's got all these cracks and crevices in the sea ice. It's not like your average lake ice or something. It's really unique ice. But that gives a lot of opportunity for plants to grow in there when the sun is back in the spring. So we actually get algae and all these sorts of plants growing inside the sea ice, which is crazy cool. And those plants feed the little tiny creatures that are in the ocean, the, the diatoms, the, all these microorganisms, which are feeding the fish, like the Arctic cod, which are feeding the seals, which are feeding the polar bears. And of course, whales are in the Arctic. And of course, people are in the Arctic. And people absolutely depend on this Arctic ecosystem for sustenance, as well as polar bears do. So this Arctic sea ice is so important just to support the entire ecosystem. But it's not only important to the Arctic, which is really cool. So I know we have people joining from all over right now. And I promise you, even though it may not seem like it, Arctic sea ice is very important for your life too. It's not only for polar bears, it's also for you and for me. Because sea ice is so massive, I can't even tell you the scale of how much Arctic sea ice is up in the north. And it's very white. It reflects sunlight away from the earth. So the sunlight comes down, it hits this white surface in the north and it escapes our atmosphere. So by that, Arctic sea ice is actually helping cool down our entire planet because it's preventing that sunlight from being absorbed into the ocean. And so it's kind of like Earth's air conditioner. Arctic sea ice is our air conditioner. No matter where we live, it's helping regulate our climate and it's helping polar bears find their food. It's a really, really cool ecosystem. Now, what we are seeing though is over the last century or so, as humans have burned more fossil fuels for energy, we've released car extra carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And at regular amounts, that's not so bad. You know, we need to trap heat in our atmosphere to a certain extent to have plants and ourselves to live. But we have burned so many fossil fuels that we have really thickened this heat trapping blanket of carbon dioxide around our atmosphere. So basically now, instead of the sea ice being able to reflect all the sunlight and heat away, some of that heat is getting trapped and too much heat's getting trapped. And now we're starting to see disruptions in our climate system. And we are seeing disruptions in Arctic sea ice. So we are losing Arctic sea ice. Every decade, we are losing more and more and certain areas are being affected more than others. So we are seeing impacts on some polar bear populations already because their habitat is changing. Now, the good news is that we do have the solutions. So if we did nothing to change anything, we could lose up to two thirds of the world's polar bears by the end of the century. But we know the solution and people are already working on the solutions. And those solutions are to move away from exclusively using fossil fuels and using more renewable energy resources. So using more solar power and wind power. And when we do burn fossil fuels, we can make it more efficient. So let's use them more effectively when we are burning them. And we can transition, we can be more sustainable, and we can try new things. And that's what we need the adults to do uh, at the leadership levels. And at least in Canada today, today is election day of all days. And so we are encouraging people to think about the climate when you're voting, uh, which leaders you know, have a good plan that makes sense, that is keeping in mind future generations of people. Uh, again, anything we're doing for polar bears really is about people. And so we're just really excited to see the outcome of today. And we're just excited that more people are talking about what we can do for our planet and for polar bears. And that's really the number one thing. When we have students coming to us saying, what can I do? You know, it feels overwhelming. Should I recycle more? You know, we have to get away from worrying about our individual actions and just look, look to our community and what's already going on big picture. What are the adults doing? What can we support? And let's just talk to each other. And that's what we say. Let's talk about it. Let's not make it this scary thing to talk about. The world is changing. We know what we need to do. We can take control. And the decisions that we're making today will affect our future. And again, we can put polar bears up as this um, kind of icon of climate change. But really, it's about all of us and sustaining all our future and keeping that Arctic sea ice in the Arctic for me as much as for polar bears and for you. So we do know that we're on the right track. We can get on the right track at least. And we're really excited to see this generation of youth uh, that are just doing such great work. And I just wanted to briefly touch on a couple of research projects Polar Bears International is doing because we are doing some really cool stuff. 
Uh, as we work to do these climate solutions, we have to, of course, learn more about the polar bears right in front of us and what they need. And so at Polar Bears International, we do have research projects happening all around the Arctic, working with different partners. We, for example, are doing some maternal denning work with moms and cubs in Norway. And we've done the same in Alaska, where we put out cameras to watch moms and cubs coming out of their den. And we do it really quietly so the mom doesn't even know we're there. We just sneak away, put a camera there, sneak away, and then record them coming out. We can count cubs and see how mom's body condition is doing and see how they're acting when they're leaving their den. So really neat, fun work there, learning a lot. There's so much more genetic work happening now than even when I started 10 years ago. Right now, there is a study to do the whole pedigree of all the polar bears we've studied in Canada. So who fathered who and who's the mom of who and who are siblings and how is everyone mixing? And, and a lot of this is because when we're looking at genetics, we we're interested in what genes are out there because the more diversity or the more different types of genes are better for any population of animals. And so we'd like to have a better sense of who's out there with who with polar bears and how much mixing they're doing. Because what genetics are really important or interesting and should we keep in the population? So that's really cool work. And then we're doing tracking where polar bears moving and when. So we can either use GPS collars or we have a brand new project. We have partnered with 3M. So the same 3M that does post-it notes and Velcro, they're like the kings of the sticky stuff. And we are currently testing prototypes to just stick a tracker on a polar bear's hair and that tracker will fall off naturally after a certain amount of time. We could put a tracker on cubs and not bother them at all, just a little sticky thing. And if we can track where polar bears are moving and when, we get a way better sense of what do they need? What kind of habitat are they using? Where did they leave shore or come onto shore? And we can just learn so much because it is so hard to study polar bears in the Arctic. It's dangerous, it's dark. Uh, they don't make it easy on us, which is fine, but that's why we need to use more technological solutions like all these cool sciencey things like genetics and then using cool cameras and cool trackers to figure out polar bears. So there's a lot of cool engineering work that goes in behind polar bear work as well. And the last thing I just wanted to mention is that we're doing a lot more work on human polar bear conflict. So what we've seen in parts of the world as the sea ice is changing, like in Western Hudson Bay, those bears are now spending longer times on land because the sea ice has changed in that region and the bears are on land about a month longer than they used to be in the 80s. So that means they're eating less. Uh, they don't have as, as much time to hunt. We have seen declines in their body condition. We still have about 800, 900 bears there. Uh, but when bears are on land longer, they have a little more, uh, they're more likely to come into contact with human communities because again, humans live all across the north and bears have a really good sense of smell and you probably know same as brown bears, black bears, bears just like to eat. You know, even though polar bears, they wanna eat a seal, if they're really hungry and it's been a couple months since their last meal and they smell some interesting garbage somewhere, they might go check that out. And that is gonna draw them into towns. Now that's not good for the polar bear and that is not good for the people. So what can we do to help prevent any of that from even happening? So people don't have to worry about it and polar bears are safe and stay away from communities. We are currently working on a bunch of different options for polar bears. So one really cool option is a radar system. We actually have four different radar systems that we are testing right now from companies all over the world that are interested in this. The original radar system we were testing actually came from military technology. Basically, the idea is that we put up this camera in a community and it just by itself with artificial intelligence is just scanning scanning around and when it sees a polar bear and it knows it's a polar bear it will alert either the town or a wildlife officer or something and it will give people a heads up well before the bear gets into town it'll say hey polar bears come in keep your eyes out people get inside or you know fire a warning flare or something to get the bear away that's really cool other things you can do of course it's just better bear proof garbage bins let's lock up the garbage so the bear doesn't get a reward when it comes in and let's just make sure people feel safe and there's a bunch of different ways we can do this and every community will be different so what we're really trying to do is talk to communities what do you need what will work for you what can we offer provide let's keep humans safe let's keep polar bears safe because coexistence is a very important thing and we are going to see polar bears on land for longer so with that, um, I just wanted to wrap up and say, again, I'm going to Churchill next month. Uh, I'm going to be live with polar bears. So this boring background won't be all that you see. We are going to be out on what we call a tundra buggy. So we have a roaming polar vehicle 
that roams just outside of Churchill, Manitoba on set trails. And we live stream polar bears for four to eight weeks, depending on how things go with the sea ice. And we'll be talking about polar bears and answering questions and doing live events. And on our website, www.polarbearsinternational.org, we have a ton of free resources for teachers. We've got lessons, uh, we've got activities, we've got sheets that you can download and watch. It's all free, it's all interesting, and we're always available uh, to answer questions. And usually when <laughs> the technology works, we've got some great photos and videos and everything for you. So again, thank you so much, and I'm really excited to hear all your questions. And thanks, Jesse. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much. That was awesome. I think uh, we had a student joining in India who sort of summed up the feeling of, uh, I think, everybody for that. So you were fantastic. Oh, thank you. Beautifully. That was awesome. Uh, what we're going to do now is, you know, in the spirit of the Direct From series from Telespark, I'm going to turn it back over to Lane for a minute to ask a few questions to kick us off. And then for all our students joining live or on YouTube, we are going to do a Kahoot quiz. See how much you were paying attention to Elise's awesome presentation. <laughs> Stuff. So I'm going to leave this up on the screen. Go to Kahoot.it. Use that game pin. You want to open that up in another tab and get ready for just a few minutes from now. But first, I'll turn it back over to Elaine to kick us off with a few quick questions. Thanks, Elaine. Here you go. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks so much, Elisa. That was fantastic. We I learned a lot about polar bears during this presentation. And even though you didn't have that PowerPoint running because, you know, tech just doesn't want to uh, agree with us uh, these days. Um, I think, I mean, I think it was still fascinating and just there's just so much that we learned uh, about what you what you do, what Polar Bears International does, and uh, about the polar bears themselves. And I think that's really why why a lot of students are watching today is because they just really wanted to know about polar bears. And I'm pretty sure I I would maybe I was just imagining things, but that gasp when that you pulled out the skull to <laughs> show like how large that is. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about like about um, what like what is your like best story that you have like when it comes to polar bears like what's your best experience that you personally have had about about with them i guess oh what a good question so i think my favorite day studying polar bears was actually my first day ever studying polar bears um it was in march i was in churchill manitoba it's about 10 years ago and when we do the march spring field work you call it that's when we're studying moms and cubs so right now moms are heading into their den, pregnant females are heading in, they're gonna give birth around December and then around late February, early March in Churchill, they leave their den with their brand new cubs and they head out to the sea ice. And that's an important time for researchers to take a look at the families. Again, how healthy are they? How many cubs are they? Does mom look okay? You know, mom's really hungry. She hasn't eaten for eight months now, so she needs to get to the ice. So we're just, just gonna pop in and see how they're doing. So. I went out on the sea ice via helicopter with the main biologist and the pilot, and we were out looking for moms and cubs. And we are over the sea ice, which again is an insane habitat. We found mom and cubs, and so we popped down with the helicopter. Uh, we They do get put to sleep for about an hour just so we can measure them and everything, and then we curl them all up together and take off. So as we're measuring the moms and cubs, we look up, and across the sea ice on the horizon was another family, another mom and cubs, and we all just stopped and we were just really quiet. And you can just hear the kind of ocean and sea ice cracking a bit and the wind whistling. And it's just, there's no, you know, there's no human for like a hundred kilometers everywhere you look. And we're just sitting with polar bear families that are just out on the ice looking for food. And it was just the most serene, beautiful moment I'd had. And again, my first day with polar bears. And that just always struck me as like, wow, this is what I want to do. I want to keep helping these families. I want to make sure these cubs have a great future. And those cubs are probably like 10 years old now and parents of their own, but I just thought that was the best day that I could hope for. Um, that sea ice is just incredible. That is a, such an amazing story. I got chills like oh, on my arm, like just hearing that. I like, can you know, just trying to visualize this whole um, serene moment and just thinking about this. Because I've never been to that area and I'm, I'm imagining a lot of people haven't. And I mean, that would be just quite an experience to see that so just and speaking of that like i mean um you've obviously you were obviously inspired by that moment like to study polar bears so what is it that we can do like students and adults together like what can what's the one thing that we can do together um to help the polar bears and just help that whole environment yeah i, I think the main thing people can do right now is talk to each other about it 
you know, take um, for your own self, keep yourself educated, read what's out there, make sure you're reading, you know, good sources of science, kind of understand and ask questions about what's going on. And then talk to your friends and family, uh, you know, mention that, hey, I'm concerned about this, or I think this is a good idea. And hey, mom and dad, like, is there solar power options in our area? And you know, maybe there's not. But it's interesting to just understand and know and talk about these things and take any sort of stigma off about, you know, caring about our shared future. And that's really what it is. Everything that polar bears are going through, you know, humans ourselves, we want to make sure our future is sustainable and we have sustainable systems and a stable climate for the good of all of us. And I think a lot of that is just talking to each other and supporting each other uh, through these changes that need to happen in terms of switching to more sustainable energy. And you know, I think people sometimes feel it's really daunting and it can be, but a hundred years ago, we didn't have airports everywhere. Like air travel wasn't a thing and now it's just so normalized. Uh, even same with our highway and road system, like in human history, that's pretty recent. So I think these changes can come and they'll be here before we know it. What a fantastic positive message, Elisa. That was awesome. And, uh, Elaine, thank you so much for highlighting this. I mean, this is what the Direct From program is all about. What we're trying to do in this week of wonder is highlight amazing programs of science and just coast to coast. And so if you guys check out Telespark, if you check out sparkscience.ca, the amazing work of Polar Bears International, you guys can see more programs like this. Of course, we do it at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. But if you want to connect locally, if you want to go into science centers in person, they are open again. There's so many opportunities to learn and be inspired. And so uh, that's what this is all about. So thank you, ladies, so, so much. And what we're going to do now, before we dive into our fun Q&A with all the classes, we've got like 100 questions already in the chat bar. It's insane. Is I'm going to bring in that Kahoot quiz. I'm going to leave Elisa with me here so she can sort of provide insight uh, if we've got some answers coming in. But I think, what are we at? We're at 207 of you in Kahoot already. That's crazy. Oh, my God. So I'm going to get underway with this. We are going to play our quiz, uh, leaving up that game pin on the bottom. And we will dive in and see what you guys think. So we'll give them each, they're about 10 second questions. The faster you answer, the better you will do. Polar Bears International are joined by today. Let's see, in three, two, one, we're gonna dive in with our first question. True or false? Polar Bears live in Canada. I hope you guys all got this one. Okay, we got nine seconds. <laughs> two more seconds, 150 answers, way to go, and our answer is 161, you got that right, that is correct. We of course live in Canada. We were talking about Churchill, Manitoba earlier, the polar bear capital of the world, Elisa's in Canada. She gets to go to our fantastic country to see one of these most amazing creatures on the planet. Uh, Elena Griffin, leading our leaderboard right now. Question two, only epic explorers can go to see polar bears. So like the, the top people, people like Elisa, like the coolest people in the world, only they can see polar bears, you have no chance. True or false, what do we think? Hmm, all right, we're done. Most of you know that's false. Anyone can go see polar bears, right, Elisa? Right, oh yeah. Come to Churchill, check it out. We've got tons in Canada, it's so extraordinary. I got to go in August and see a polar bear live. It was an amazing experience, something I'd always wanted to do. Um, so you guys can do that too. There's so many amazing things happening in the country. Power Tiger, way to go. Rapidly got into first place. True false, polar bears have been seen hunting whales. 20 seconds of this one, I gave you guys a little bit of extra time to ponder it. Change your answer if you wanted to go. Over 205 of you have already answered. That's crazy. This is the biggest kahoot we've ever done in our history as an organization. It's a new thing that we're doing this year. So thank you guys so much for being so jazzed about it. Three more seconds. All right. So only a few of you, more of you got this wrong. Polar bears have been seen pulling beluga whales out of the water. This has been featured in natural history documentaries. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen in nature. Um, uh, that uh, Again, a creature can hunt a whale is just wild to me. All right, who's on our leaderboard? We're, we're doing our last question in just a second before we go to Q&A. Rocky Otter's got the lead, barely over Rapid Newt. And a quiz, were you paying attention to the end there with Lane's question? What can you do to help save polar bears? Tell your friends, reduce carbon emissions, climate footprint, or both of the above? Hmm, I think I sort of gave away gave away the answer here, maybe. What do we, <laughs> what do we think, Elisa? Hmm, <laughs> I'm very curious. <laughs> Five seconds left. <laughs> We're not going to tell them. Okay, the answer is both of the above. Your friends, the more you share, the better we'll all be. And reduce your carbon footprint, something that helps uh, conserve all species, not just polar bears, not just the Arctic sea ice. So much that we can do jointly, uh, together, individually. And our winner for our Kahoot is... 
Before we go to questions, dun, 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 Rocky Otter's got the late way to go, guys. Thank you so much for participating. That was so much fun. That's so cool. And now I want to dive in with questions. Uh, if you have questions for Elaine at Telespark, by all means, please share those as well. But we are going to start by going to our Division 20 Hillcrest Middle School folks, part of the Orange Bears team that is joining us today. And then we'll go to our other Hillcrest class in a second. So Division 20 Hillcrest Middle School, come on in, guys, and uh, share away if you have a question for Elisa. Anybody have a question? Mm, but hi. Say hi, everybody. Dip Toy, say hi. 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 No, 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 no. Any questions, Dip Toy? Any questions? Mm. How about when, when was the last time, Lisa, that you saw a polar bear live in, in action? Nice. Oh, this has been the longest stretch I've gone for a while. It's been two years now. <laughs> Um, because of you know pandemic and everything changed things up. So I'm really excited for October when I get to see a polar bear again, but it's been about two years now since I've seen it. <laughs> much, much too long, we gotta get you back yeah. there. So excited. And yeah. truly, if you wanna see the best live streams in the world, it's Polar Bears International. They do amazing stuff with the Beluga <laughs> Boat, do amazing stuff with Polar Bears, check out their website, so much cool stuff there. All right, our second Hillcrest Middle School team. Oh, Division 20. Oh, Division 20. Oh, 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 Share a question. Yeah. Okay, question. Quick, quick, quick. Question. No, I don't want him to. Okay, what do you want? No, no. no. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Jacob, question. Oh. Here we go. Okay. Okay, listen. Quiet. So there, uh, there are uh, various different classifications of whether certain species of animals are endangered or not. Whether you have animals which are very like thriving over here, and then you have animals which are very critically endangered, and we really have to work hard to save. Where would you say polar bears fall on that spectrum? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we look to the IUCN, the International Union on the Conservation of Nature, to look at the overall picture of polar bears. And overall, right now, they are classified as vulnerable on the red list. So they are not considered endangered at this point, but they are vulnerable because of their risk of uh, population loss due to habitat decline. Now, if we look at individual populations, different countries kind of look at their own polar bears maybe differently. But big picture, right now, they are considered a vulnerable species. All right, great question, guys. Yeah. Uh, Haley and Avery, you're joining at home. Uh, welcome in, so nice to have homeschoolers. And if you guys want to unmute your mic, you'll be able to share a question with us. Come on in, girl. Hi. Hi. Uh, I don't think we have a question, do we, No. Nope, that's okay. I'm so glad you guys enjoyed and could join us today. Well, what we'll do then is take a few quick questions from YouTube. We're nearing the end of the broadcast. Time flies and you're having fun, people. Okay. Um, so Michelle asks in Miss Maris's class, do they have fun when they fall and slide on the ice? What do we think? <laughs> we do think they have fun. Yeah, sometimes we see polar bears being pretty silly. Uh, we think they're having a good time. We especially notice that the polar bears in Churchill, you know, after they spend all summer on land, maybe get kind of bored. That first snowfall of the year, if we are there, it's always hilarious. The bears do seem to be thrilled that they have snow. They start rubbing in the ice, rolling around, sliding. We see them sometimes do what we call a polar bear starfish. So they lay on their belly and spread all their limbs out and kind of shuffle along the ice. And it does look like they have a blast out there when the conditions are right and they're feeling good. Most animals, we've seen play in so many creatures now. It's so exciting to see this. Honestly, you can look up YouTube videos for days of animals having just the best time with snow and other things. So I'm so glad we got that question. Oh, right, <laughs> the whole whack on YouTube. This is great. Uh, Robbie in Mr. Rose class wants to know, how long do they hibernate for? Great question. Polar bears actually do not hibernate. Uh, they're one of the few bear species that really doesn't have any hibernation. So that summer, uh, the summer season where they're not really eating much is kind of like a low period, but they're not hibernating. The closest they get is the, the pregnant females that enter a den to give birth have almost a form of hibernation. So they're going to slow down their metabolism a bit. They're going to give birth. They're going to conserve their energy while they're nursing their cubs and then they'll emerge from their den. So that's kind of hibernation, but only for pregnant females that are giving birth. All the other bears, they're up and at them all year long. Yeah, very, very cool. Um, I want to note too, Mr. Anderson, Rocky Otters, the, the winner of our quiz, are in Stony Plain, Alberta. So where are you, Mr. Anderson's class? You guys rock, that's awesome. Um, we got a bunch of questions about when they're born. Are they born with fur <laughs> and are they born with their eyes open? Yeah, so when they're born, they're completely helpless and they're just tiny. They're about the size of a stick of butter. And if you think of their mom being like five, 600 pounds, 
that's a really tiny baby. <laughs> and they are born just with very fine hair. They look quite pink, their eyes are closed, very, very helpless, but they grow incredibly fast because their mother's milk is the fattiest mammal milk we find on land when oh. they give birth. So it's, it's like us drinking whipping cream. It's like a third fat. And so those cubs, they go from itty, itty bitty to 20, 30 pounds in just a couple months. And if you think of a human baby growing at that rate, that would be terrifying. But for polar bears, it's necessary. And that means that they can uh, grow big enough, get strong enough and head out to the sea ice with their mom as soon as possible to go hunt some seals. So let that be a lesson to all you kids. If you get the true <laughs> whipping cream, you can be as big and strong as a polar bear. I like yeah. screaming at the size of a stick of butter. No, don't take my advice. I'm lying. Um, but <laughs> so much for all these great questions. Honestly, we have like so many questions that we get more than we could possibly answer in the broadcast. And so I know you guys are one of the most or in tune, amazing education teams in the world. Could people go to polarbearsinternational.org and ask more questions and learn more about the amazing work you guys do? Is that where we guide them or are there other places? Absolutely. Yep. Definitely. Please go to our website. You can find us there. You can find us on Facebook. We have archived all sorts of short videos, long videos on YouTube. And again, we will be live through uh, from mid-October through mid-November all the time. So you can tune in anytime and pop us questions. And we also live stream via explore.org, which has a ton of wildlife camps. So you can check that out too and find us there. Very, very cool. Thank you so, so much, Elisa. Before I bring you and Elaine back in to say a quick goodbye, I just want to highlight again, this is part of our Week of Wonder amazing series of the Canadian Association of Science Editors. Do check out their website. You can see all the work being done nationwide uh, for the special weekend from Science Centers coast to coast to coast. Uh, this is all part of Science Literacy Week, so hundreds of events, virtual and otherwise, across Canada. So thrilled to get to have the chance to take part in that this year again, which is so much fun. Uh, and if you want to learn more about Telespark series, uh, go to sparkscience.ca, check out their Direct From series. You can see more great programs like this. And of course, if you want to join us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we do 50 broadcasts every single month featuring amazing scientists and explorers like Elisa. So come on back in. They're all free for everyone involved. It's just a really, really good time. Elaine, Elisa, thank you so much for joining us today for the special program. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much. It was great being here. I'm glad that we had so many questions for Elisa. Like, I mean, polar bears are a thing. We <laughs> love them. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you uh, so much. We love yeah. working with Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants and with Telus Spark. And it's just been a blast to talk to you guys this morning. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys all get the chance. Go to polarbearsinternational.org. What we do at the end of every broadcast, this is new to Elaine, but old hat to Elisa. We bring in all our live groups to say a quick thank you and goodbye. So our Hillcrest Middle School teams, get ready. Haley and Avery, come on in. Uh, join me in saying a big thank you and farewell. Have a